What is up, everybody? Welcome to the live stream. Oh, it's such a freaking trope. It's such a freaking cliche to start the stream with what's up, everybody. What's up, guys? Oh, well, I guess I'm a product of my time. Do kids still do that? Do people still start with what's up? I've always thought it's dumb. It's dumb. Like, when you want to, like, start... When I watch a YouTube video, just get to the video. Get to the video. I'll be like, what's up, everybody? I'm blah, 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 blah. Just fuck, just get to the content. Having said that, you'll now go back through my videos. I succumb to the impulse. But every time I catch myself doing that, I'm like, don't do that. Just freaking start talking about the content. You don't need to. What's up? <laughs> Cute. Uh, oh, okay. So, um, where are we going to start today? Where are we going to start today? Uh... I'm so tired today. I'm so tired. Look at my hands. Do you see the blisters? I'm, I'm a working man. I'm a working man. I got my trusty tracker. And uh, I've been outside building a fence for my wife. And myself. But mostly my wife. In that, in that her happiness is my happiness. I did it for myself. But... It's not my project. It's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a lot of work. And I were, the, the stream was late. And Blunty, I feel like we need to tell him. The stream was late because me and Blunty were talking about fencing methods. Yet another uh, tactic uh, or skill that you have, Blunty, that I was unaware of. <laughs> yeah, when you live on three acres, you got to do something. Three acres. That's about how much I have. What do you fence in with your three acres? The whole place. Because it's not like a giant farm. Like, do you have livestock? Uh, no, just dogs. Uh, but I mean, even it's literally it's more to keep the neighborhood dogs out. Yes, thank you. Yeah, I mean, we if we don't, I mean, even then they still find a way in the back of the fence through the woods and they get in my freaking fence. And there's three dogs out there at two a.m. and I'm like, what is going on? Yep. But yeah, uh, that's living in the country slash, <laughs> uh, oh. you know, small towns. So we had a neighbor <laughs> years ago who had a donkey, and they named this donkey Houdini. We, well, I don't know if that's his official name or just what the people in the neighborhood called him because he would escape. They couldn't keep Houdini in. Uh, they, I don't know if they were bad at fencing or he was a particularly good escape artist. But apparently donkeys are pretty clever. And he would get out and we would just, this was before we had a perimeter fence. We would just find this donkey wandering around. He got in our chicken coop once because we would get up in the morning. We'd open the chicken coop. The chickens would come out and walk around. And he had just gone. There was a donkey in the chicken coop eating the chicken feed. And I was like, does it get more pastoral than this? But, uh, yeah, we started putting up fence. We put up our fence when we got pigs and the pigs escaped one day. Uh, they, had a, they had a fence around their little area that failed and then they escaped and they say if you have livestock, you know, like obviously if you have, you know, hundreds of acres of cattle, it's a different story. But like you should have the fence around the paddock or enclosure that the animal's in. And then you should have a perimeter fence as a last resort. <laughs> so um, so I'm beat. I'm beat today, but I'm going to get so jacked up from from excitement from this live stream that it's not going to matter. Uh, what was I playing with before the stream? Look what I got. Oh, yeah, here, I'll turn it on for you. I got I got one of these. I got curious enough to buy one of these. This is an RF Explorer. It is a, hello, there you go. It's a spectrum analyzer. And it can do things like, you know, tell you when there's transmissions in your area. I'm a little surprised uh, because there is Wi-Fi down in my basement and... I'm sure there's 5 gig Wi-Fi, and I'm surprised to see how weak the Wi-Fi is down here, but there's a little blip of Wi-Fi. And you can go all over down to 400 megahertz, etc. Uh, up to this, this particular one goes all the way down to like 50 kilohertz and all the way up to 6 gigahertz. You can just basically, with the right antenna, you can just look wherever you want to look and see what's out there. That's kind of cool. Um, I have a question, though. That's why I'm, I'm not I'm just showing it off. Um... Because I also, I, I, I showed this to a friend of mine. I was like, look what I got. I am so cool. And he was like, yeah, that's cool. Uh, but I have this one. He said, I have this one. As you can see, I was like, well, why is yours cooler than mine? Why is yours cooler than mine? And immediately also bought his. But I'm not sure which one I should keep. 
Okay? I'm not sure which I should keep. Uh, this one has a touch screen. Both of them can connect to a PC, but this one has, I think it's a better PC app. This one has better specs in terms of like the scan rate. Um, and it's way better built. Like it's got a really nice metal case. Like I really want to like this one better, but my God, I can't like the ability to just have this little touch screen. So if you're in the field working with it, you don't have to hook it up to a PC is so compelling. And I'm, I'm so tempted, like, which one am I going to get the most use out of? Obviously, obviously I bought both of them and I have a, sh I have a short window of time to, in which to return this, uh, if I decide to return it. Anybody out there who has experience with either of these, please let me know. Um, M. Bundy suggests the Hack RF. I'm serious about that, by the way. Anybody who has experience with either of these, the one is the RF Explorer and one is the Tiny SA Ultra. I feel like the RF Explorer is hands down the better device, but I just wonder if I will get as much actual use out of it because of its shitty interface. Are you? Is your goal yeah. to use it mobily? Like, well, is it important that it has a screen on it and you can use it somewhere other than at your house on your computer? Yes. Yes. So good question. Good question, Blunty. Like the, what motivated me to get this is I was uh, out at a, a flying location and people kept getting blasted out of the air. And I was really sure there was interference and I wasn't able to identify the interference. And I was like, my God, if I had a spectrum analyzer right now, I could try and home in on the interference. Uh, and so I thought, well, that's not the only reason I got it, but that was like the thing that got me thinking that direction. And um, so it would be for field use in addition to bench use. Like for bench use, I would absolutely keep this one because you just hook it up to a PC. And as far as I can tell, like the, the scan, the sweep rate, like how its refresh rate basically is way faster. Uh, I don't know in terms of accuracy, it's better. Uh, but and it hooks up to the PC, so it has a much better PC app, I'm told. I haven't, I haven't tested it yet. Um, but if all you want is something that you can pull out in the field and, like, use it, I feel like this is a loser. Because, like, look at the interface. My God. Like, it's like a TI calculator from the freaking 2000s. I, yeah, I would say, like... I don't know. If, if you could just use a laptop or something, then a HackRF yeah. or a HackRF clone is probably a lot better. But that doesn't have, like, an integrated screen. So you'd have yeah. to have, like, a laptop with you. Now but I've heard you of... get way more out of something like that than I think you get out of something like you're using. But you don't get the functionality of having the little screen. But if the screen's not helping you, then that's yeah. also not great, right? I've heard about HackRF. I, I always think of HackRF. HackRF is a software-defined radio, right? Uh, yeah. And basically, I think of HackRF for people who are building radio devices and or doing like hacking and freaking and and testing. But I think of HackRF as more of a sort of a transmitting device than a receiving device. I guess it, HackRF can act like a spectrum analyzer. Yeah, the main thing I've seen it used for is receiving, like you're uh, using it to. Yeah, I mean, I know a lot of people that submit to things like AirAware or whatever that. I can't remember what it's called, but that like yeah. ADSB tracker thing he used similar things to HackRF to scan them. And oh. uh, Bunny says he has one with a screen, so there are apparently different versions of it that you he can has get. A I know there are with clones. a screen. Yeah, I know there are clones of the HackRF too that are cheaper than the main one, but they have varying quality, I think, because of hardware. What is this? Porta pack for HackRF one kit. Oh, so so huh? Oh. Oh, you know, this is making me feel very happy because when I when I went when I, I showed my friend this and was like, look what I got. I'm the coolest guy in town. And he was like, yeah, those are cool. You know, I got this, you know, and I was like, oh, oh! it was like that scene in American Psycho with the business cards. I was like, oh, it hurt me. It hurt me. And then I immediately bought this one. But this, oh, he doesn't have this one. Yes. I hope he's not watching this live stream right now. <laughs> that's interesting. So the hacker, that's going to be even more money. But is it better? Is it way better? I bet it is. I mean, I think, like Kilo Zebra says, if you're only looking for a spectrum analyzer, then like it's way overkill. But if you're interested in doing a bunch of other cool stuff with it eventually, then it would be great to have. That's sort of, I think, where you're at. Yeah. Uh, what if I'm mostly just interested in doing basic spectrum analysis? 
you know, like, but also I want to have, I want to be the coolest guy in the room when everybody pulls out their business cards. <laughs> look, look, I'm not proud of it, but <laughs> uh, I'll look at it. I'll look at it. Uh, <clears throat> that, that's cool. I'm, I'm, this is really appealing to me because it's got it's like the best of both worlds. It looks like this has both the good specs and the portable screen, right? Is that what I'm hearing? Carlos FPV, I know the RF Explorer will do a waterfall on PC, but I'm thinking about field use and the ability to have like a nice, nice, because a lot of trend, like a lot of transmissions aren't going to show up very well without a waterfall plot. It's going to be difficult to see an intermittent transmission without a waterfall plot. So is that what I should do, guys? Oh, Portapack doesn't have a spectrum analyzer app. Oh, well, f it's useless. Does it have a spectrum analyzer app? Can you do a waterfall plot? <sighs> anyway, I don't know. Uh, oh, darn, I was so ready to buy it. It's a waterfall, but no line graph. Nah, I'm okay with that. I think I'm starting to think maybe I'll, I'll make a video about it. Although there, there have been people who actually do like real spectrum analyzer reviews, like real engineers, which I am not. So maybe I shouldn't like, you know, step out of my lane, but like, I feel like this for 200 bucks, like I have worked with RF equipment in the past, although I am not like an expert engineer, like some of the guys who are probably watching this. Like I, I'm, I'm very much a user, but an enthusiastic user. This is a crazy value for $210. Like I've seen reviews of it. It's, it's like reasonably accurate for 200 freaking bucks. What you can get, like you used to pay five ten five thousand dollars for something like this. The idea that you can get it this cheap is amazing. Um, anyway, maybe I should. Maybe it's a good idea. Maybe I should ask one of the antenna guys. Anyway, uh, that wraps up the section of the live stream. Ah, fuck. Things Joshua spent too much money on. On the on the premise that it's a business expense, but really he just likes to buy things. He impulse impulse buys test equipment, and we're gonna get on with the rest of the live stream. This freaking antennas just fall out every time I open this thing. It's crazy. Useless. Should be zippered. An authentic Tiny SA Ultra isn't even $120 on AliExpress. Well, why did I pay $207 for it? Cat and Bry, where were you? Cancel order, cancel order. That's the Amazon tax. <laughs> That's a huge tax. Wait, let me see if I can cancel my order. Maybe it hasn't shipped yet. Actually, it was. It'll be delivered tomorrow if you order in one hour. So I'm gonna guess that it has shipped and is not cancelable. Uh, viewer edit order. Huh, huh. Arriving tomorrow. Cancel items. Shipping soon. Cancellation isn't guaranteed. So there's a chance. Sh item price too high. Request cancellation. Oh, whoo! Thanks, Captain Bry. Attempting to cancel. Okay, I don't know if it'll cancel. Anyway. Does the port pack or does it not give you a field, field spectrum analyzer? I'm open to buying it. But only if I can get an actual spectrum analyzer out of it. If you mute like in the Discord, if you mute uh, Moe's video and then go a little forward, it does appear to show what you're looking for. Where is Moe's video, Blunty? The last post of the Discord there. This video here, Kakarev? Yep. Why am I muting it? Is it like really loud? It has music in it. Oh, I don't like music. No, <laughs> I like music. Okay, okay. Ooh. That's interesting. What is it? Oh, oh yeah. Oh, this menu. I'm getting excited about just looking at this menu. Looking glass app. Searching for frequency. Okay. That's like a waterfall right there. Oh, yeah. We're scanning, baby. Oh, look at that. Move marker to frequency. Press button to confirm. 
So he's like scanning the Tesla's plug-in if nobody, if somebody doesn't know what's happening. That's interesting. Or whatever car that is, I don't know. That's interesting. That seems like it would be effective at like looking for transmissions in certain frequencies, you know? Can you like, oh, oh yeah, look at that. Oh yeah, no, that's hot. That's hot. I like that. I'm just enraptured. Quality live stream content, everybody. So, so what you're saying is that is that this? Is that this? Should I buy this? I don't. Now I know how other people feel when they look at my content. I don't understand any of this. Tell me what to buy. Just tell me what to buy. I just want to buy the right thing. <laughs> <laughs> huh is this it okay all right thank you guys appreciate uh appreciate your appreciate your feedback m bundy suggests i buy that okay great uh i i'm feeling like i'm gonna return the rc explorer okay all righty. Well, that's 20 minutes we've spent talking about this topic. Thank you guys for the feedback. Has your excitement of interesting technologies uh, re-innovated you to do the stream? Yeah, no, I'm, I, especially if we're talking about buying things. I like buying things. Looking Glass app doesn't allow you to measure the signal intensity as you scroll the marker like a real... I'm okay with that, Kilo Zebra. I don't actually usually care how many dBm something is. Maybe I do. Mm. I got to think about it. I'll think about it. Carlos FPV suggests the RF Explorer. Well. All right. Let's get on with the, with the stream, Blunty. Let's get on with the stream. Uh, we have many questions queued up. If you guys want to get a question answered, uh, hit, the, uh, hit the super chat down below. Hit the dollar sign down below. But we're just going to get right into it. I have a 45 amp ESC. Uh, thank you guys for humoring me as I as I yammer about little bullshit things that I want to buy. I appreciate it. It's a little self-indulgent, but I hope you're entertained. Or at least not too bored. I have a 45 amp ESC, but a motor draws 13 amps at 100% thrust. Is that bad? <gasps> no. I mean, it, you're, it's probably a bigger ESC than you might really need, but it's fine. The ESC amp rating is a maximum. Some people mistakenly think that the ESC is going to push too much current into the motor. That's not how it works. The voltage is the analogy for the pushing of current. And as long as the voltage is correct, the amount of current that flows through the load will be whatever, whatever it's going to be. It won't be too much for the load. So if the load is too high, then... The, vo the, the device can be damaged by excess current flow. Sorry, if the voltage is too high, then the device can be damaged by excess current flow. The amp rating of the ESC is a maximum amp rating that it can handle. And as long as you're below that rating, you're fine. An analogy uh, that I like to make, and if you're not already familiar with like fluid, like then this may not actually make things more intuitive to you, but to use a fluid or plumbing analogy, voltage is like pressure. Amps is like flow rate, gallons per minute or gallons, I guess. Gallons per minute, does amps have a time unit? It doesn't. No, amps is coulombs per second. It does have a time unit, right? Chat, is amp, one amp is one coulomb per second? Ooh, I'm, I'm digging deep for this one. So amps is like flow rate, volts is like pressure, and then there's the resistance, which I'm not sure like what the fluid analogy would be. I mean, obviously fluid systems have pressure. So as long as the uh, current rating of the ESC is higher, it's higher than what the motor will draw, everything will be fine. Um... 
One Coulomb per second is one amp. Wow, it has been a long time since my, uh, I would have learned that in EMAG uh, in 1994. Oh, I like this one way better. You guys, why are you showing me this stupid drawing with like the dudes? Why, why, let me ask you. Why, why would I want to see that? Oops, why would I want to see this? When I could see this. I mean, really. Much better. Thank you for that. Appreciate it. Air um, soft. Yes. I do see Jonas from the chat says, but I have four motors. I think maybe he's got confused about what you're saying. Yeah, so uh, the ESC amp rating is per channel. So you got a four in one ESC, it's rated for forty five amps. That's forty five amps per motor. You're good to go. You're good to go. Oh, Syncopad, he has four motors, JB, come on. Yeah, no, I, yeah, I know. I was getting there. It's still, he's fine. That's how it works. Uh, Vegan Kao asks, I have a Radiolink AT9 and an Eoshin VR007 Pro. I have to remind myself, I think that's a analog receiver. Yeah, that's a analog. Yeah, okay. That's an analog goggles. As I move the goggles close to the transmitter, interference occurs in the video. Any fix? Yeah, don't move the goggles close to the transmitter. I mean, you've got a presumably two AT9 is 2.4 gigahertz transmitter, and you've got a 5.8 gigahertz receiver. Um, there shouldn't be a huge amount of interference between them, but when a transmitter gets close to a receiver, you get interference. I guess my question would be, how close do they have to be before there's noticeable interference? Because if it's like six inches, it's like, just don't do that. You know, the joke, the old, the old joke. Guy goes to the doctor and says, doctor, when I move my elbow like this, it hurts. The doctor says, well, don't move your elbow like that. Boom. It's not a funny joke. It's an old joke. Uh, so like, you just don't put it. But if it's like, you know, two feet when you're holding it in your hand, that's not normal. Seth Beryl says, why is silicone, I like this question so much, I'm going to grab it. Why is silicone conformal coating preferred over acrylic? Acrylic is more brittle and cracks more easily and chips off, whereas silicon is more flexible. I have not personally verified this with independent testing. That's just what I've always heard. And if you think about it, acrylic is like nail polish. Nail polish is acrylic and nail polish chips off. Silicon is 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 more flexible so it sort of jibes for me that's what i've always heard but i should let you know that i haven't like i don't know that for a fact do you think a three inch sub 250 freestyle drone is right for beginners sure yeah absolutely absolutely um if you've practiced in a simulator and you want to start with a five inch i'm okay with that just do it safely but three inches is fine too but i would always have you start in the simulator first I would have you get reasonably, like me, like I would get get to the point where like, if you if we were to think about like a human, like first you're a baby and you can't walk at all, and then you crawl, right, and then you're kind of toddling around but you still fall over sometimes. That's where you need to be in the simulator, maybe even a little better than that before you go fly the real thing, because the real thing. When you, whenever you crash, there's a chance you're going to break something and it's going to cost you money. It's going to be a pain in the ass. So you want to be kind of toddling around and not falling over too much in the simulator before you transition to the real thing. That's my, that's my advice. Got a super chat here from Cali FPV. Thank you for $5, Cali FPV. Have you heard of the fire sense extinguishers and would it work with lipo fires? I have not. Well, maybe I have. Fire sense extinguisher. Uh, what is the fire sense extinguisher? I have heard of these. Uh, what does it do? It's a compact, easy, and efficient extinguisher. What do you do? How does it work? Does it just poof out? Look. Oh, that's a lot of fire there, buddy. Oh, it's just like a spray can. Oh, that worked real good. So here's the thing. Um, first of all, do they have a lipo specific one? I'm 
I'm not sure. Um, the thing is, once a LiPo battery starts going off, it is difficult to impossible to stop it because it has the oxygen that it needs inside the cell. So all of the combustion, all of the elements necessary for combustion to happen are inside the cell. You can smother it to, to sort of minimize the flames, but the cell will continue to smolder and burn. Uh, so trying to extinguish a lipo fire doesn't make a lot of sense. Uh, my rule of thumb is when a lipo starts to go off, the number one thing you want to do is move it to a safe area where it can't start any secondary fires or you want to contain secondary fires. But the idea that you're going to put out a lipo with a fire extinguisher, it doesn't, it, it doesn't make sense. Um, uh, Daninder refers to something called the jewel lithium battery fire extinguisher. So I have heard of some fire extinguishers that are specifically made to kill a lipo fire. I don't know how they work, but it is something that has just started in my, at least it's just come to my awareness in the last maybe six months or so. Um, so, you know, pin that, that it's out there. But generally fire extinguishers, traditional fire extinguishers, they won't put out a lipo fire. They will only extinguish the secondary fires, which is still a big deal because like the lipo goes boosh and very quickly burns itself out. But it has lit so many other things on fire in the meantime that your house burns down. So here is the Lith X2 fire extinguisher to protect against the unique threat posed by lithium battery fires. Revolutionary lithium battery fire extinguisher. What does it do? It's not going to tell us. It's not going to tell us because it's a secret. Well, let's take a look at a video. How much is it? They're not going to tell us. Find a distributor. All right. Uh, I am very annoyed that the United States is not first on the list. That's not how this is supposed to work. That I don't care who's first in alphabetical order. America. North America. Okay, okay. Now that's just a slap in the face. Okay, fine. It's the global region. The United States is not first. Fine. That's okay. I will let that slide. But to go to North America and freaking freaking Canada is first on the list. Shh. That is an affront to the dignity. Even Canadians would agree that they should be second. Come on. <laughs> I posted a video explaining how it works. Aqueous vermiculite dispersion. Are you protected? No. How the fuck much are they? Stop. Why won't you tell me how much they are? No, you got to call us. Shut the f oh, I hate you. Uh, okay, Blunty's got a video showing how it works. Great. Yep. I don't think we need this music. Yes, that's exactly how it goes, correct? Yep, that's damn... So far, so good. Oh, oh, look at that. It like smothers the battery. That's interesting. It cools and smothers the battery to stop the runaway. That's really interesting. That's re okay. Very cool. Uh, too bad no one will tell me how much they are. Well, maybe I'll buy one. Test it out. That's very interesting. All right. Uh, so, to sum up, is your fire blanket any good? Yes. The reason your fire blanket is good is that, so, so here's the priorities for a lipo safety. Okay, are you ready? Number one, when a battery is damaged, stop using it. 
only actually keep and use healthy batteries. This will, this is the single biggest thing you can do to protect yourself from lipo fires. Um, number two, when you're charging, be present so that you notice when things start to go wrong. A lipo will, will seldom just immediately, boom, fire. You will almost always, if you're paying attention, have some warnings that something ain't right. Now you may only have 10 or 15 seconds of warning, depending on the battery, you may have, you may have more if you're really paying attention, but you almost always get a warning. Be present because the sooner you respond to the situation, the better it's gonna be for you. Number three, this is the one that everybody breaks, including me. When you're charging, charge somewhere where if there was a fire, it would be okay. Now I charge on the bench right behind me. And some, and someday, if I have a fire, I'm gonna be real sad. But I feel like I do enough of the other things to be okay with it. That's my personal risk profile and it's personally the chance I take. And you know, if I turn out to be wrong one day, I'll be very sad. Um, now, all of those things have failed and you have a fire. See, if you were doing number three, that if you had a fire, you would go, huh, oh, I got a fire. It's gonna be over soon and life would go on. But you have now have a fire in a place where there you don't want there to be a fire. Your number one priority is to prevent secondary fires. The lipo will burn itself out very quickly in a few seconds. Um, at least the first cell will. If it's a multi-cell battery, then the, s the subsequent cells will usually go off. It'll go boosh, 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 boosh. It, sometimes it'll go up all at once, but sometimes it won't. But that'll be over very quickly and it will have lit other things on fire. So smothering the flames absolutely is effective. The other reason why a fire blanket can be useful is if you can wrap up the whole damn thing in a blanket and move it out the window or out the door, that can help you, you know, can help mitigate things. And then the last step, the last step is use a fire extinguisher to put out secondary fires. In my opinion, that's the order that you should go do it in. Um, yeah, we should also, I would say also mention bat safe. Absolutely. Uh, everything I, 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 my batteries are never not in a bat safe unless they're being flown pretty much. So bat safe is a container that is used for battery store. No, no, just click this and nothing happens. Cool. Cool. I love how we have RC battery safety and drone battery safety. No, nothing, nothing. The whole website just doesn't do, doesn't work. Okay, great. <laughs> so BatSafe is a fire protective box that's designed for storing and charging batteries. You can store batteries in the BatSafe. You can also, there is a pass through that you can, you can charge batteries in the BatSafe. And the, uh, the idea is that it is a fire temperature protective case. And then there's a filter on the lid to filter out the smoke. So this, you get less smoke damage if one goes off. This yeah, is sort of, of the, in chat... the gold oh, standard. Sorry. Yeah, go ahead. I was just gonna say a lot of people in chat have mentioned the ammo can. And the only downside to the ammo can is that yeah, also make sure you take out the, the, uh, the grommet in it, the... Yeah the seal uh, so that air can get out. But basically the problem with the ammo can is that it doesn't filter the smoke. So you've got the fire contained, but it's a really hot metal box. And now you've got smoke pouring out. That's like acrid, dark lipo smoke. Yeah. So, you know, the, the goal is to have, you know, the bat safe is more expensive, but it filters it and it prevents all that from getting out. Cause it's an insulated box too. Yeah, correct. Well, and the ammo can theoretically, the sides of the metal could get hot enough to ignite something outside. Now that's, that's a theoretical, I don't think it's very likely, but it is theoretically possible. Um, as you said, Blunty, I'm in fact going to draw a little diagram here. If you do get the ammo can, one thing you can do is you can line it 
with a fire blanket or line it with even some kind of um, like the, the, the fire retardant cement board that they get. I've heard of people cutting sheets of that and lining it to create to, to prevent heat transmission. But as you said, Blunty, what you have to do, there's a there is a, a gasket that goes around the top lip and and if you, it makes a relatively airtight seal well watertight seal for sure and so if uh one goes off inside it creates a pressure vessel and i'm not suggesting it's going to like explode like a bomb but it's not good so what you can do is you don't want to remove the front of the gasket because then this this locking lip won't lock correctly it'll just be floppy so what i suggest people do is they just remove like just like a little bit of the gasket here and here and you could just kind of pull it out and cut it away but leave leave behind the front part so that the lid still closes correctly and that creates enough of a vent that the smoke can get out but plenty as you pointed out uh it, you're still going to get smoke all in your house which isn't great it can do almost more damage than the fire well not more damage but it's i got certainly one more better than nothing but... oh yeah I have one more video. Let's see. This is from Heliographics, who tested a ammo can. Here we got a metal. Is that a metal ammo can? Yeah, he's you know he's removing. I don't. You'll see that. Well, he you can't see it because he was careful about it. That little locking clasp is now loose and floppy. But he's just doing a demonstration. Woo! We got a rocket. It's a rocket ship, guys. We cannot see the screen. Oh fuck! I'm so sorry, guys. My bad. Thank you, Blinty. So he removes the entire gasket, which I don't recommend. See, he kind of, it almost looks like he kind of, see how he kind of faked setting that down as if it was still clasping tightly? Because it's not anymore. Check this out. It's like it's trying to take off, man. It's trying to go to the freaking moon. And there we go. Boom! Oh. <laughs> uh. And then look at all that smoke coming out of there. Jeez. Why not drill a hole? Yeah, you could drill a hole and put a filter in front of it. Yeah, you could do that. You could. I mean, I don't know how well it would work. Woo. She done, boys. Wonder how hot the outside of that thing got. Now we got the bat safe. Here we go. Oh. Well, that's much nicer smoke. Oh! We still got a little bit of sparks coming out of there. But you can see the smoke is still not pleasant. Like, I'm still not, like, volunteering to have that in my house. But the ammo can did a really good job of containing the flames. And as test pilot Ian points out, like, the advantage of the ammo can is going to be that if you're there, when you start to see it going off, you'll grab it by the handle and you'll throw, you know, throw it out of the house. So, anyway, how many batteries is recommended to store in one? Well, the more batteries that are in there, the bigger the fire is going to be when one goes off. So you just roll the dice. I mean, there's, a, there's listed values on their website for what they can hold uh, safely. Yeah. What I recommend, I feel like this is a topic worth spending a little bit. Apparently, we're spending a you, long time. 661FBB says the ammo can looks safer. Did you see the two fire jets and the ammo can launch upwards earlier? Like, I think yeah. you're looking at a different video. Yeah. Um, I recommend having some fireplace gloves or welder's gloves nearby. Um, because with these, if you have a battery that's starting to go off, if you shove your hand in one of these and grab it and it goes poof right in your hand, you're going to be in a much better situation than if you were holding it uh, with your bare skin. So a fire blanket, also decent. Oh, anyway, um, always a topic worth spending a little time on. Let's do super chats. We're going to, we're going to, we've been, oh my God, we're 45 minutes into the stream. I'm super talky today, Blunty. I don't know. I don't know. Um, but we're going to do super chats and we'll keep doing super chats till we run under them, run out of them. <sighs> wow. El Chingon FPV, no GPS home arrow. I do get several locks. Any idea? No, you don't. Um, El Chingon, I'm going to guess that you're using the DJI V2 system. And when you're seeing 
satellite lock, you're seeing 14 sats. With the DJI V2 OSD, for some reason it reports zero sats as 14 sats. No helm arrow and 14 sats locked with the DJI V2 means you don't have a working GPS. So that means that could mean the GPS has no sats locked. It could mean that the flight controller isn't talking to the GPS at all. But that's my that's my take. Um, so first of all, do you have a, a lit up GPS icon in beta flight configurator, right? If so, then the flight controller is talking to the GPS and you can move. If not, then that's the problem you have to solve. What micro frame do you recommend for 1S 1002 22,000 KV Bobito? Firefly Nano? Any other recommendations? Uh, parkour guy, I don't have a specific recommendation in that class. I have flown the Firefly Nano and really liked it. I don't know if it's like better than the Bibido. I feel like uh, if I don't mention the Odonata, I will be uh, I will be ostracized from my own uh, Discord server. Is that in this class? Uh, the Odonat, I think, is like 1.6 inch props. Is that about the right class? This is, many people feel that the Odonata is just the absolute beast for open prop, the goat for open prop uh, in the Bobito class. I believe they're the same size class. So, like, if I had, if, like, if, if you know, a demon appeared in front of me and said, tell me the best 40 millimeter quadcopter frame in the world or I'll eat your soul. I would be like, oh, Donata. Not because I necessarily believe that because I just feel unqualified to comment, but because so many other people say it that I feel like I got a good chance of being right. Oh, Donata is a little, oh, Donata HD is a little bigger. Is the oh, Donata, the analog oh, Donata in the right class? Sometimes drone stuff asks, how can I improve my FPV? Thank you for two Canadian dollars. It's a very open uh, question. The number one way to improve at anything is time. Uh, do the thing. But the problem is that they say uh, practice doesn't make perfect. Perfect practice makes perfect. Hang on. I have, an, I have something to demonstrate that. Uh, I want you to look at this man. This man is a Russian martial arts master. He's been practicing martial arts for years. And you're going to tell as soon as I show you this video that he has worked a lot. He has put in many hours of practice at what he's doing. Let's take a look. Look at this guy. Mm -hmm. it reminds Man. me of the Star Wars kid. It does, doesn't it? Like, but what I find fascinating about this is this guy has clearly practiced a lot at what he's doing. Now, what he's doing is completely pointless and on other except as a like a form of expressive dance he's like no 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 you're doing it wrong <laughs> i have no idea what i'm seeing here no no like this here's how you do it <laughs> what he's doing is is pointless as a form of self-defense or offense or uh, yeah no do it like this <laughs> so the point the idea here is that practicing the wrong things will make you good at doing the wrong things. When you practice, you have to practice with some... Oh, yeah. Oh, I see. No, now it makes sense. But now it makes my, total my, sense. He's locked his hand. Do you see how he's locked his hand? Go ahead, Blunty. My only analogy here would be, yeah, but I bet that guy is physically fit. And so in the same way, using sticks, no matter what you're doing with them, is going to make you better at the sticks. So when you do need to do something better, you're better. You're not going to get perfect, but you're going to get better, right? That's where I would... I, you're right. You're right. You're right. Um, 
my point is uh, that if you if you the number one thing you can do to get better at flying is fly more, just put in more hours, because most people are probably not putting in so much time that they've sort of plateaued. But it, as you put in, if you were to say, I'm going to put in one pack a week, you're, you're not going to get very much very good. You're not going to stay very good. Your overall skill level will be relatively low. If you're going to say, I'm going to put in 10 packs a week. Now you're going to be improving. But if at some point, if you were to say, I'm going to put in 100 packs a week, if you don't do that with some intent, you're going to end up just repeating the same stuff that you already kind of know how to do and not, and you're going to plateau. So the idea is that if you're not at the point where you started to plateau, simply putting in more time will make you better. But eventually you'll hit a point where you'll plateau and you have to, you have to practice with some intent and you have to think about what am I doing? What could I be doing better? What am I bad at? Where are my weak spots? Pulling in, pulling in other people to like, there are people who post their Velocidrone runs on Reddit and they're like, I'm racing and how can I get faster? And I look at their runs and they're faster than I am. Like I would not be even close to their time, but I look at their runs and go, well, you're blowing out that corner. You're blowing out that corner. I can see what they can't see in the, the ways that they're losing time. Now, is that, that's not because I'm a better pilot than them. It's just because I'm a different person with a different perspective. So eventually you hit a point where you need to have someone give you, give you feedback on what you need to do better. But the number one way to get better is to fly more. Hey, real quick. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, there's something going on with your setup. Your LUT or something keeps dropping out. Is that something my, that you're doing? No. My LUT you keep keeps turning, dropping out? You, you keep turning like gray, like you're, you have no filter or LUT on the camera, and then it pops back to normal. Really? I think it's happened twice, or maybe more. Really? But Brandon yeah. mentioned it, and I have seen, I've seen it happen. So. Hold on. Do you mean... That's weird. I mean, I have no idea what would cause that. Do you mean like this? Yes. That's that's weird as shit. I have no idea what would cause that. Oh, like why would OBS do that? Gotcha. That's that's really weird. That is a LUT. It's not supposed to do that. Weird. Okay, well. I do agree. It looked grayer. It wasn't as red as when you did that click. It, it reminds me of something you did to your camera one time, but maybe it's not your camera. Maybe it's something you had applied. But isn't there something you can do to your camera to like make it gray or something? Like yes, this? that. That's exactly what happened. Yes, that. Oh no! This means that the I knew like I'd the, seen it before. It's, this means yeah. that the preset knob on my camera is breaking. Yep. Wow. Well, this camera is like freaking. This camera has been around for a while. Yeah. For 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 those who may be curious about the behind the scenes. This is what I how my camera is set up for streaming. But when I record, my camera looks like this. Hang on. There's still the LUT. When I record, my camera looks like this. And then color correction is done in Premiere. So I have two presets on my camera. No, not that one. Went the wrong way. I have two presets on my camera. Come on. Right. This one and this one for live streaming and recording. And then for live streaming, I have this LUT that tries to get it close to the finish. Anyway, uh, that sucks. That means I'm going to have to send my camera body off to get repaired soon. And I don't know. That's going to be annoying. Well, time to buy a new camera. Right? That's what that means, right? Um, Riz FPV wants to know, I'm looking for a diversity receiver or diversity switch I can use with 1.3 gigahertz receivers, patch antenna and circular polarized. Any suggestions? Uh, Riz, not really. Um, there are very few 1.3 gigahertz receivers out there. There's a Flywoo one and there is a Maytech one and there's a ready-made RC one. Those are the three I'm aware of. Are any of them diversity? Let's look. Oh, there you go. All right, got it. Boom, problem solved. Major, major, uh, there you go. That's what made your day. 1.3 gigahertz dual VRX analog goggle receiver module. That's what you need to buy, my friend. 
Does the Maytech one? Uh, no, Maytech one is not diversity. Oh, God dang. VRX, please. VRX. The one, uh, ready made RC one. Oh, look at that. Custom tuner. No, also single, single, not diversity. So the flywoo is your answer. Do not buy the flywoo. Damn it. Do not buy the flywoo, says Nasty FPV. So that's the thing. That's the thing. Thank you, Nasty FPV, for speaking up. I was about to say, this is a brand new product and I can't vouch for its quality. You wanted diversity. Boom, here it is. But like the ready-made RC VRX, everybody who I know who flies, it's like, oh no, it's good. The Maytech one is the go-to for a long time. I think a lot of people feel the ready-made RC one is better. I mean, that's going to be the old diversity though, right? So you're going to get yes. flashing. Yes. Okay. Yep. 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 Okay. So like, we don't know if this is good. In fact, we have one data point from Nasty FPV who says it's shit. The thing is, if you're flying long range, which 1.3 gigahertz, that's what it's for. Diver does diversity even make sense? Like you're so far out, you're just going to have one antenna picking it up, right? I don't know. Maybe you want uh, polarization diversity. Good luck with that. Kmart FPV, continuing the super chats, which we only just got into like 10 minutes ago. Kmart FPV, thank you for a $5 super chat. Should I shoot ultra wide on the O3 if I'm using gyroflow, compensating for crop? Kmart FPV, I, that, to my mind, that's what the ultra wide setting is for, is for when you're going to do gyroflow and you know you're going to get a lot of crop. Yes, that's what I would do. Obviously, obviously, you know, everybody's situation is different. And I'm sure there are people out there who would argue that like the fisheye on the, on the, uh, on the ultra wide is detrimental and they'd be like, no, no, you should shoot wide. Like Mo, are you for real? Shut up, Mo, shut up. No, that can't be true. Mo says, oh my God, is that true? I'm so, I don't want that to be true. People are telling me that gyro data is only recorded in wide. You cannot use ultra wide and gyro flow. Only wide for three. Why? That's stupid. That's stupid. That's so stupid. I. Uh... Why? It the gyro is there. Why would you turn off gyro recording in ultra wide? DJI, DJI, DJI. You you're so frustrating. You're so frustrating. You, why do you do these things? I don't understand. It's so frustrating. So there you go. Wide 4.3. Is that true? That's got to be true for the... Is that true for the O3 as well? Am, am I misremembering that the O3 worked with Gyroflow? So I'm, I'm like... No, that was a GoPro. Was that true for the O3 as well? I think it must have been. Um, okay, I didn't know that. So, so is, is, go ahead. Is 4.3 here technically more sensor anyway? Yes, because it's a native 4.3 sensor. But you should so, just I mean, shoot in 4.3 anyway. 100%. Because you want to crop, you want to max crop, and anyway. like you want to have the ability to get them all the sensor. Yeah. And what you could do is you could record the gyro data with the flight controller, which is not going to be perfect because the gyro is not in the camera, but it might work. But it sounds like you need wide four three, and that's it. If you want that, if you want that native gyro data, bad for life says DJI only has a few bugs compared to hundreds of the competition. Dang you, DJI! But bad for life. So there's two things going on here. The first thing going on here is that DJI has set the bar for themselves so high that. That it like it's actually the same thing. The more that I think about it, these aren't bugs. Like DJI has a fairly good track record of fixing actual bugs, but then there are things where it might be a bug, but but I perceive them as being so capable that I assume it's intentional. 
Because like in this case, is this a bug? Did they mean for it to work differently? Because I feel like if they wanted it to work differently, they would just make it work differently. I feel like they can do whatever they set their mind to. So if something doesn't work, I assume it's on purpose. And then I get real indignant because like, why wouldn't you give me that gyro data in ultra wide? Just record the gyro data. Anyway. Ron, thank you for 50,000 IDR. That's a, that's the single biggest that's the single biggest number I've ever seen on a super chat. Now, just out of curiosity, let's just double check how much that actually is in USD. It's $3. Okay. It's 50,000. That's what's going on? How can this even be possible that the exchange rate can be What's going on in Indonesia? I should look into this. I'll, I'll save that for later, though. It's not, a, it's not a live stream issue. Why is the Indonesian currency so weak compared to the dollar? I feel like there's a story there, and I want to know the story. The question is, I'm building a 10-inch long range using 3115 motors. Can I use a 60-amp ESC? I'm planning to make a lithium-ion pack. Suggestions for the cell brand. Um, Ron, uh, yes. Yes. It's okay to use a 60 amp ESC as long as it's a good quality ESC. What you're going to find is, especially if you're not, if you're, if you were building a 10 inch drag racing drone to go 100 miles an hour, then 60 amp ESC might not be enough. But you're building a long range cruiser. I think you're going to find that you're actually pulling way less current than you would think, like less current than a five inch. Okay. So 60 amp BSC, as long as it's a good quality, 60 amp BSC should be fine. As far as lithium ion pack, if you're buying individual cells, the absolute best are a brand called Molly Cell. Molly Cell. These are, as far as I can tell, the best uh, lithium ion cells that you can buy today for, for use in drones and high power use. Everybody I talk to who builds lithium ion packs is just so hot for these right now. They're expensive, but they're very good. And um, as far as batteries go, no. The uh, upgrade energy, that's it. As far as batteries go, one of the best lithium ion cell or pack makers is this company Upgrade Energy? Uh, so I've talked to some folks who do long range testing, uh, people who are trying to just get the absolute maximum range out of their birds, you know? And again, these batteries win the tests so consistently. Whatever Upgrade Energy is doing, it's really impressive. They're making great packs. Uh, so uh, you can buy them directly from Upgrade Energy but you also can buy them from your favorite, uh, you buy from Amazon, you buy from Progressive RC, et cetera. Uh, these are hands down the best lithium ion packs you can buy today. I, and I don't know how they do it because obviously they're buying the same cells everybody else is buying, but whatever they're doing, they just win every time. Uh, so uh, make sure you do all long range flights in Mexico to avoid FAA regulations. Grim Ripper, good to see you. Let's, let's, uh, Grim Ripper, uh, believe based on the currency that he donated that he will be doing his long range flights in Indonesia. So probably, probably as good as Mexico. Good to see you here for the stream, man. Vikas, thank you for a hundred rupees. Three of the capacitors in my Foxier AIO smoked, but the quad still flies the same. Can I continue flying? Yes. Yes, absolutely. The, the, the thing is, number one, why did those capacitors smoke? And is the thing that smoked them going to come back later? And number two, capacitance is like you usually have more capacitance than you need on a well-designed ESC. But as those capacitors smoke, the capacitance goes down and eventually you're more likely to finally smoke the ESC or smoke the motor. So, yeah, you can, but uh, it's going to get it's going to be more likely to smoke it. 
Stallion Butter, thank you for a $5 super chat. Why is my Runcam Wasp significantly blurrier and blockier than my Nebula camera? Is it a firmware issue or just a turd product? Um, the camera should not be able to affect the bit rate and the blockiness. Okay, that's all about the VTX and the antenna. So what I would ask you, Stallion Butter, is did you swap the same camera onto the same VTX and antenna or did you swap the whole VTX and camera together? In other words, like my first guess would be that either you have a broken antenna on the second VTX or the configuration of the VTX is not the same, like it's not going out of low power mode. Or maybe a connector issue. Connector issue. But it's not the camera. Do you agree, Blunty? Yeah, I just know that, well, like the connector on the back of the camera or the cable is like where I also lean because I've seen a lower bit rate by dropping some of the pins. That's interesting. I, I didn't know that. I didn't know that. Fair enough. Maybe when you reinstalled the camera, you didn't plug the connector in quite right. Okay. Uh, good, good, uh, good info. <laughs> Midwest RC says there was an M80 under the ammo can test. Huh? That's cheating. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, Freak Light. Thank you for a $5 super chat. I have a question. My drone motors on throttle sound great. When I introduce roller pritch, the motors are noisy. Uh, whenever you have noisy motors corresponding to a pitch or roll input, it makes me think that you don't have your RC link settings correct. That you're getting noise in the RC command, and that's making the PID loop freak out. Blunty, how do you like that response? I know you, you're you also, we did a troubleshooting video a while back, and I was really impressed with some of your insights. You yeah, um, the you definitely want to be running the right preset for whatever you're running. And it's quite common to hear n noise in motors and just general flight issues uh, if you have not set the correct precinct, uh, preset, if you're at a higher packet rate. Yep. So I would definitely set that. So uh, what you're going to do is go to the presets tab in Betaflight and go to the RC link presets. And then like, for example, if you're running Express LRS, we'll just search for ELRS. And especially if you're running 500 hertz or 1000 hertz, I think is more likely to cause this problem. If you don't load the correct preset, you can get noisy motors or weird sounds out of the motors when you when you deflect the stick. That's my guess as to what's going on. Hopefully, I'm right. <laughs> Easy EFPV wants to know, do you know what this is? Has an analog camera, but HD interfaces too? Thank you for a $5 super chat, Easy E. Uh, Blunty, do you know where Easy E posted the link if they did? Is that... Uh, it's a they, YouTube message, so and it automatically filters links. So, so Easy E, I would love to answer your question, but I don't have the link because YouTube filtered out your link. I can't see, I can't see what you're trying to reference. So maybe if you could give like a partial link without the HTTPS, so YouTube doesn't filter it, or something like that, so I could could find it. Plenty, keep an eye out for that if you would, please if he's still listening and still wants to get that addressed. Freaklight is running ELRS. Okay, great. Uh, continuing the Super Chats, Riz FPV got you. Got you. The only diversity 1.3 gigahertz VRX we could find was the uh, Flywoo, which people said was crap. Jason Murphy, need FPV friends in Richmond, Virginia. Richmond, Virginia? Come rip. All right, anybody out in Richmond, Virginia, hit Jason Murphy up. How, how are they supposed to contact you, Jason? <laughs> Good luck. Uh, Alan, what ELRS packet rate should I use if I only fly whoops indoors? Thank you for five euros. Uh, Alan, if you're flying indoors, you're probably not going very far. You probably don't need a ton of range. So theoretically, I would set the packet rate to 1,000 hertz as high as possible. Or the, the D500 rate, if you need a little bit more re link reliability. You're going to get much shorter range than like 50 hertz, but probably enough range. Like as long as your LQ stays high. Like a lot of the tiny whip flying I do, I'm just racing in a single room. At that point, I may as well be at 1,000 hertz. Now, there is a catch here. 
And that is, if you have an SPI receiver on your TinyWhoop, then uh, you can't do that. The You can't go above, I think, 250 hertz. But yeah, for no, you, indoors, yeah, go ahead. 500 hertz works, uh, I believe, it's just none of the uh, lettered modes. So the none F of the D or F is, modes. Is 500 hertz not an F mode? No, it's a normal oh. mode. Oh, my bad. Glad you're here. <laughs> Uh, corrupt syntax. Thanks for a ten dollars super chat. I broke an arm three weeks ago on your QV desk kit, so I bought another kit as backup. But my order's being held up by the arms. Can you use your tyrannical powers to make them get them? Yeah, unfortunately, corrupt syntax. Uh, the arms sell out really quickly, and they are constantly manufacturing more. I'm uh frustrated that people who bought the frame are not easily able to get spare arms. I I, I don't. I mean, I have harangued them about it. A little bit. I'll prove it. Hang on. <laughs> so. I'll just say, while you're talking about this, this is, to me, it's pretty ridiculous how bad it is. There's a yeah. bunch of people who need arms. Like a yeah. bunch of people who've asked me about arms. Oh, yeah. Yeah, so here's a conversation I had with uh, a person who I will allow to remain anonymous um, who says they, uh, they are being stocked frequently, but demand is high. I think the next order is already in. The goal is to keep parts consistently in stock. Um, I, don't, uh, I don't know the exact uh, frequency at which they come in. Like I don't get reporting when they come in and how many they were. But uh, the story that I hear is that uh, they come in and they sell out. I think um, – so what I would suggest is that if you want them that you like put a pre-order in so that you get instant notification when they come in and then uh, you know keep track of how long they're out. But, uh, but I don't know the specific frequency with which they come in and how many there are. This, uh, it's hard to know if that story is true. I mean, like fundamentally, I want to you know believe that I'm being told the truth by the people I'm talking to. These are people I've worked with for a long time. You know, I wouldn't like to think that uh, they were just you know making stuff up. But like the story, oh, the reason they're constantly out of stock is just because we sell so many of them. Well, why aren't you making more of them then? Right? Why aren't you manufacturing enough to keep them in stock? He says that the goal is to have them constantly in stock. But the freaking frame has been out for years, for over a year. And so I don't know why they wouldn't be regularly in stock. It's frustrating. Why is no one? There we go. Thank you, Blunty. Jesus Christ. I'm watching it. I, I got it. I know, it. I know. No it's like, why are people yelling at him and no one's timing him out? Okay. Uh, focus, there's zero chance that Lumineer would put the J the JB uh, stuff up on CNC drones for replacements. Lumineer was, that's, you know, they want to make their money on the frame. I will say, and I'm not, I, I want to be very careful. I will say that there are Chinese clones of the QAVS, not the V2, I don't think, but the top plate is the same. I've heard of people going there if they need spares. Um, all right. Um, what's a good 6S LiPo for long, fast punches on 7-inch? That's not, I don't, Atreides, thank you for $2. Uh, I don't think there's enough information there to answer that question. Like, you would want a big battery. I feel like something in the 3,000 to 5,000 milliamp hours 6S range is where you're going to want to be. But there are a lot of other uh, factors affecting that answer. 
All right, that brings us to the end of the Super Chats. We are now caught up. Let's go back in to the regular chats and see what people are asking. June Loco asks, how can I configure the brushed newbie drone Acrobee? New beta flight does not recognize it. Any suggestions? Uh, June Loco, the newbie drone flight controllers have a custom build of beta flight that you can only get from newbie drone. So if you, uh, you won't be able to flash it from Betaflight Configurator, you'll need, well, you'll need to download the firmware from Newbie Drone and flash the local file off your hard drive. Um, a, a lot of times you'll find that Newbie Drone hasn't released the newest version of Betaflight when you're when we're in a transition period. So right now we're transitioning from 4.4 to 4.5. There may be Newbie Drone flight controllers out there that don't have a 4.5 target released yet by Newbie Drone. And there's really nothing you can do about that. Uh, except hassle newbie drone uh is it possible that this is actually because it's the really it's like a brush flight controller like because that's what they mentioned was brushed so is it possible this is just like an old weird flight controller like a quicksilver or something or clean flight or yeah who knows man i don't i'm trying to see what they sell on the latest one well, but like if what's... you go to their page for their brush you can't even pull up the flight controller it's not listed Newbie drone brushed Acrobee hummingbird, whatever. Acrobee 65 brushed bind and fly in stock. What? Ooh, with turtle mode. It just says flight controller B brain brush. I would assume any LRS flight controller has beta flight running on it, but it also should connect in the latest beta flight without any problem. You should be able to connect. It's so just maybe it doesn't. It maybe issue. it doesn't have beta flight. Yeah, that's true. Maybe it doesn't have beta flight at all. Like it's running quick. What would it be running? Quicksilver. What's yeah, maybe. The other firmware that doesn't work. It does like not configurable by the users. Silverfish, no. Uh, I know they shipped some flight controllers without beta flight. Maybe it doesn't have beta flight at all and you can't configure it. That's a possibility. Mm. Maybe see. silverware? Silver silverware? That's it. Yeah, so here's the... Yeah, bingo. Thank you, Plenty. I don't know why I was thinking Quicksilver. Is that also a thing? So here is their Silverware branch. Uh, they have definitely released flight controllers with Silverware on it. In, there we go. The Hummingbird flight controller is the first Silverware FC. Here we go. Bingo. Brushed newbie drone flight controller. First Silverware FC to include OSD and VTX control functions. Here it is. I'll bet this is what's on your quad. And if that's the case, it runs the silverware firmware, and that's why you can't connect to Betaflight. You basically can't connect to it at all. Uh, yeah. So. Oops. There's like, basically, you have to work around but it's really just, it's not configurable for the most part. Except via the OSD menu. There are settings you can change via the OSD menu. And they can be flashed. But they can't really be configured by users. Okay, well hopefully that points you in the right direction. Silverware is the original NFE brushed whoop firmware that everyone ripped off. The official brushless overhaul is Quicksilver. Ah, uh, great. Thank you, Aber. Appreciate the clarification there. <laughs> uh, why does Bubby run a spoiler? What is its function on a drone? Its function is to make you ask questions. Don't fall for it. Its function is to piss me off and to make you ask questions. It has no function in terms of making the quad fly better or, or yeah, zero.
Nader FPV asks, is there a 4S LiPo out there about 450 milliamp hour, but also 100C? I, I can't say for sure, no Nader, but I don't think so. The smaller the cell, the harder it is to make it an, a high C rating. Um, so like the best quality, the best thing you can do with a little 1S450 is get a good quality cell and get away from a pH connector if you're using a pH connector. So like this is some of the best 1S 450 milliamp hour batteries you can get. I would just get these, either the pigtail or the direct plug, your choice. They have a good quality BT 2.0 connector on them and this cell is an absolute beast. Now it's nominally rated 95C, who knows what that means, but like, if your quad can't fly good on this battery, then the battery isn't the weak spot. Okay. Are you, Go ahead. Are you, he said 4S LiPo. Oh, flip. No. Well, who makes a 4, who makes a 4S 450? What, the, what does that even exist? I think beta quads use those, right? That's like I remember with my... 95 beta fpv 95 i think came at the 4s like 450 well, or 550. Shit. holy shit the hell is this wow yes exactly those <laughs> well the gowning yeah i want you to know dogcom has a 4s view so dogcom all right what flies on a Forest 450? That little Beta FPV. Uh, oh, I can see it in my mind. It was 3S and 4S. Everybody yeah, the in the I, chat was like says dog comes 95X, right? That's the one. Yeah. That's the one I had. That's not the one I'm thinking of, but yeah. What's the, what's the 4S 450? That doesn't just, my brain doesn't like that. Okay. Okay, great. Dogcom or, or Dogcom. Apparently, it's, chat says Dogcom's the best. Thank you, chat. Uh, what are your printer settings for printing TPU for on your camera for your quads? Well, I'll show you. Um, hold on. So I'm printing to my Bamboo X1C, or uh, X1C, yeah. I'm printing using Orca Slicer instead of Bamboo Slicer, but it's, that's okay. S same as if we just open up this TPU print that I did a while back. What I do is I tell it that I have the textured PEI plate. Hang on, let me zoom in. You're going to hate this answer. This answer is not going to be nearly as satisfying as you think it's going to be. just want to warn you. I tell it that I have the textured PEI plate, and then I use the generic TPU profile. And then I pick, you know, what layer height I want. So I, I typically just use, hang on. A lot of times I'm in a hurry when I'm printing something for my quad. So I'll typically use the 0 0.2 layer height, maybe even 2.24, because I just find I don't care too much about fine details. I just want to print it as fast as possible. That's about it. And uh, as far as like, oh, well, what's the temperature? What's the retraction? I don't know. That's the beautiful thing about having a bamboo printer. I don't care. I don't, I mean, I yeah, okay. I could tweak these things if I want to, but I never have to. This is it. Bamboo has ruined me as a 3D printing nerd. Like, I had just enough of the painful process of figuring out how to make a 3D printer run that I feel like I learned, you know, how to, like, calibrate and tweak a 3D printer. And now I'm retired. And I'm just, you know, sitting on the beach, sipping a drink with a little, little umbrella in it and just printing things. 3D printing is no longer a, a, a nerdy hobby, you know. It's just I want an object and I print it. Look at this. You can, this is going to be very difficult for you to see on the camera. This little ring right here that holds my microphone broke the other day. 
It broke. Hang on, I have a picture somewhere. I'll show you a picture. Uh, it broke the other day. Oh, here it is. Boom! I printed another one! Look at that! That came off my printer. That's nylon. Shabam! <laughs> yeah. So what settings do I use? The 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 presets that Bamboo gave me. Not a fan of cloud everything. It's okay. Burnt nougat. The the bamboo printers have a LAN only mode. Uh they, they don't have to cloud everything. Uh I know some people who don't even put their bamboo on the network and they just use SD cards, but they all also have a LAN mode if you if you prefer. How long did it take you to design the replacement for for the microphone? Well, about this long. Uh, which one did I use? I don't remember exactly which one did I use. Uh, I don't know. It was I, about that long. Oh, that looks pretty good. Yeah, okay. Uh, files. Road NT USB holder. Download. Boom. Downloaded. Open in Orca Slicer. It took me probably 15 minutes to figure out the right combination of search terms to find the part that I needed. Uh, Auto Orient. Done. Right click, change filament, filament five, done. Well, filament five is currently TPU. Okay, I had to go in the other room and load the nylon filament. And good to go. Slice, print. 15 minutes later, I had a part. Okay, 48 minutes. It didn't take 48 minutes. Maybe it did. Okay, an hour later, I had a part. Doom, just like that. It's a beautiful freaking thing. A beautiful freaking thing. I love this printer so much. I have never been... I can't think of almost anything that I've ever... Well, I was going to say bought, but Bamboo sent it to me. So full disclosure. I can't think of an appliance that I've been as happy with as my Bamboo printer. It's... it's It really... You can get from I need a part to I have a part so seamlessly with this printer... It's, it's like just having a genie freaking rub the bottle, make a wish. Done. Would you purchase the AQ Mini for 249 or eight for the wait for the A1? I currently have an Anchor Make. It's comparable, but it's not bamboo. Um, the A1 Mini? That uh, Here's the thing. All of the... So I personally only own the X1C. I want to say that, get that out of the way. My understanding is that all of the bamboo printers have the same ease of use. Some of them have different capabilities, like a larger build volume or a hardened nozzle. But the experience of open file, click print, go, get project, get product, that's more or less the same on all of them. So it's just a question of what your needs are and where your budget is. Like with an, a Bamboo A1 Mini for 250 bucks, there is no reason that an, anyone in the world should buy an Ender anymore, ever. Okay, that's a little bit of a strong statement. I, I, I retract that statement somewhat. But like the date, how much is an Ender 3 these days? Like how much do they actually cost? Are you freaking kidding me? A freaking Ender 3 from Creality is $189 by now. $168. Forget it. This printer, forget it. If you were thinking about buying this printer for $170, just save up for another month until you have $250 and buy the bamboo. And you will get five times more printer, maybe more, in terms of capabilities. Like, there's just no question. If you can get an Ender 3 for 100 bucks, maybe... Maybe that's the right value for an Ender 3. But, like, it's so much better. Maybe Bamboo have completely screwed this market. Yes, Bunty. 
Killdozer says the Ender has so much support. The Ender, Ender has so much support because everybody bought it and they had to fix it because it breaks all the time and you have to print parts for it and you have to fix the head and you have to fix the extruder and like, yeah. I've been through it. I know I've had multiple Creality printers. All, all of the problems that you need support to fix on the Ender just don't happen with the bamboo. You just get it and you take it. And like, I don't want to oversell it. If you go search on Reddit, you will find people who had a problem. They're, like nothing is 100% perfect. But like, it's so much better. They just, instead of delivering you a bare bones, effed up product that you have to like cajole into working for you. And that's why there's so much support for it. They just deliver you an effing working product that works. I had to replace the nozzle on my printer. It was 10 bucks to get a new nozzle and like 25 bucks, maybe 15 bucks for a nozzle. I don't remember. But it was approximately twice as expensive to get a whole new heat sink assembly. And I just went, eh, I'm lazy. And I spent the extra 15 bucks or whatever it was, 10 bucks, 15 bucks. And it was like two, two hex screws and three plugs, new hot sink assembly installed, perfect, easy. Yeah. Bamboo is more of an appliance. Good luck fixing it. Uh, there's a little bit of truth to that, but not as much as I think people make it out to be, Eagle FPV. There's a lot of maintenance you can do on that printer yourself. There are very few things that may absolutely require you to send it back to Bamboo. But, you know, it's not for, it's not for everybody. Anyway, big fan of it. Uh, Zenny, thank you for 10 euros. Zenny says, my new quad isn't showing the correct max amps and milliamp hours drawn. Your current sensor is miscalibrated or not working. Uh, Zenny, you need to calibrate the current sensor. To do that, you are going to, here's what you do. I'll tell you real quick. Put the battery on a charger, fully charge the battery. Put the battery on the quad. Fly until the battery is empty. Look at how many milliamp hours it says you consumed. Now it says 100 to 200. That's so far off that I'm, I'm like, I don't know, you're gonna, this calibration isn't going to work the first time because you're so far off, okay? But let's say that you have a thousand milliamp hour battery just to keep the be math simple. And let's say that your, your OSD says you pulled a hundred milliamp hours. Okay, put the battery back on the charger, recharge the battery, and look at how many milliamp hours the charger puts back in, okay? So the quad said I took out 100 milliamp hours. The charger says I put back in 1,000 milliamp hours. Based on those two numbers, we can infer that the current sensor is off by a factor of 10. You're going to take a ratio, you see? And then you're going to use that ratio to adjust the current sensor. And you're going to do that here in Betaflight Configurator in the Power and Battery tab. You're going to adjust, hang on. Why? Well, oh, I can't do this with a, in virtual mode. Damn. Right here where it says Amperage Meter. My screen, I'm, I don't actually have a flight controller plugged in. I'm in virtual mode, so you can't see it. But here it says amperage meter. You're going to adjust the amperage scale. So the problem is this. You're off by such a huge number. If you were off by a factor of two or three, then you just adjust the number. But like, if you, I think you're off by a factor of 10 or 20. I guess it depends if it's like a if it's like a, a mini quad uh, like a little micro quad with a 400 milliamp hour battery maybe i think that doesn't work out though with a max i don't know but if you're off by a factor of two or three you just adjust the amperage meter scale here and you adjust that up or down to to change the the amps that are being read to get that milliamp hours correct 
Bry asks, isn't there a, a wizard now? And I think there is. There's some like little wizard button or something, Can right? Can there be a current wizard? That doesn't make sense. That doesn't add up to me. Mm, let's find out. Is that a 4-5 thing or is that a configurator thing? Hang on, I'm going to plug a real quad in and we'll see what's up. Calibration. No, it just said... I, uh, maybe I'm missing something here. It just says, use a multimeter. Before calibrating, make sure divider and multiplier is set properly. Well, why am I calibrating if I know those values? All right, hang on. Let's test it out. Let me get a battery. Hold on. Uh, where's the battery? Okay, battery plugged in. What happens if I hit calibrate? Yeah, see, yeah, but the problem is I have to have an amp meter. I, ha I have to have an actual amp meter. And I'm, I'm only going to be, and, and I'm only going to be calibrating the amps at the bottom of the scale, which usually it's going to be a little bit off. I, I would rather calibrate using an actual flight. So this is fine for voltage. This is fine for voltage. I don't think this is very useful for amperage because like right now I'm pulling, what am I pulling? Like a half an amp? Maybe like as soon as I start flying, now I'm pulling four, five, six amps. And I think it's, I think it's, I would rather use the milliamp hours through the battery method. I think that's going to be more accurate, more representative of what's actually happening when you're flying. These guys with their free bamboo printers says super super deluxe. If my bamboo breaks tomorrow, I will immediately buy another one. Now I might not buy the X1C with the AMS. I might buy like the PM P1P, the smaller one, but I will immediately buy another one. Trust. I mean, I just I uh, yes, they sent it to me for free. Uh, but like my enthusiasm for it is is independent of the amount that I did or didn't pay for it. And everyone I know who I've recommended one to, who has gotten one, is like, oh my God, this thing's the best thing ever. So like, uh, I'm a, I'm a, a enthusiastic proponent. I'm a shill for bamboo. I will, a hundred like if you accuse me of being a shill, well, for a lot of companies, I'll be like, F you, F you. I resent that, I have integrity. Uh, I, the, uh, Bamboo is the company I'm the closest to just being a shill for. Like, I still have integrity, but, like, I, I'm i I'm a little bit unreasonably enthusiastic. Like, I should be more critical of some things about them, and I just don't care because I enjoy their printers so much. Uh, Madsex says the P1S is the right buy. There you go. Also a shill, by the way. Did you buy that P1S, Madsex? Did you buy your X1C or did they send it to you, you shill? I want I want to get Madstech, you and me, buddy. Let's get t-shirts and my t-shirt will say, he's a shill with an arrow pointing one way and yours will say, he's a shill with an arrow pointing the other way. Let's do it. <laughs> you bought it. Oh, loser. <laughs> <clears throat> Why does it say crossfire on one of the plugs on my ELRS controller? Your ELRS controller? What controller do you have, Kermit FPV? I must know. Regardless, it just means the protocol that it talks with. Yeah, but why is it a plug? What, what, what plug is outputting crossfire? 
on a I mean, controller. He might be talking about a receiver. It's probably just the wrong word. I, I mean, it, it can only be so many things, but we know what CRSF does in relation to ELRS. Yeah. And CRSF you know, is right. the protocol that you talk to to the radio just... and over the wires and not over the air. Over the air is Express LRS. iFlight Commander 8. Does the iFlight Commander 8 have a Crossfire output plug for an external module or something? Commando 8. That's why I'm curious. Uh, is that one of the ones with the weird external module that's not a standard module bay? Okay, let's go. Show me. Yeah, okay. So this doesn't have a standard module bay. And is that what it is? Where are you, where are you seeing that? Where are you seeing the crossfire plug? Oh, it does have it. It, it can be swapped to a standard module bay. Damn. Where are you seeing that? I'm really curious. Because that's a... Hmm. What plug says Crossfire? All right. I don't know. Maybe he's going to tell us. Got a super chat here from Corrupt Syntax. I didn't know that was a thing. And was not, not alone. Was just trying to make you laugh with tyrannical powers and throw money at you. Thank you for throwing money at me, Corrupt Syntax. I do appreciate it. Thanks for $10 Super Chat. Uh, Run Puppy says, I still have the original frame with the horned arms. Thank you for $2, Run Puppy. Indeed. Uh, RIP the horned arms. Vayburn, thank you for 10 euros. Thanks for the content. Bardwell, it's helped me a lot getting into the FBV hobby. Could you give your opinion about the Genzace iMars D300? Yes, okay. Someone once said uh, that I became cynical over the years, and I think they're wrong. I've always been cynical. That's not new. I hate everything all the time, mostly, except for my bamboo printer, apparently. Um, let's see here. What is LiPo? I don't want a LiPo battery. IMARS D300 GTEC. What? Why is the... Where's the battery charger? Why is this a category? Uh, which one is he asking about? D300 GTEC. D300 GTEC. Is it just the color? Yeah. So 129 bucks is not a bad price. Uh, 300 watt AC, 700 watt DC. That's okay specs for the price. <laughs> Two channel, 16 amps. What's this little plug down here? Is this some custom adapter for some battery? Some. It seems to have a plug here for some kind of oddball battery that I'm not familiar with. What is that? I don't know what that is. If you're trying to charge that kind of battery, I guess you need that kind of plug. <sighs> okay, it's not documenting what that weird balance plug is. Okay. Looks like a barrel connector. Yeah, but why aren't there two of them then? I don't think that's a barrel connector. It's some kind of pin. I don't know what that is. Um, so, uh, like, it seems like a fine charger, and Jinsei makes okay stuff, but, like, personally... My Hoda D6 Pro, 120 bucks, same price, almost the same specs. Okay, only 200 watts AC. That's much worse, actually. Mm, okay, okay. It's the G Tech. That's what the that's what that extra plug is for Gen Zace batteries with the G Tech setting. They can like read the number of uh, read the number of cells or whatever.
Like, personally, I probably would take the D6 Pro. But it seems like this has pretty good specs for the money. I'll give it that. Atreides, thank you for a $20 super chat. Very generous. Thank you so much. Um, I've seen the video where you're comparing the Moz 27 and the Camaro Pro 7. Those really long poles seem very nice. I wondered if those were 3,500 milliamp hour 100 C packs or what. Um, pretty sure on the Moz 27 and the Camaro Pro, I was using a 6,000 milliamp hour GEP RC lithium ion. No, no. That was at that time. Uh, that I was using two 1500 milliamp hour 6S in, in parallel. I had a parallel adapter, so it was basically a 3000 milliamp hour 6S. Yes. Jason Murphy wants, says, do you have an affiliate link for the bamboo? Hell yes, I do. I mean, since you asked... Since you asked, I wasn't going to say anything, but yes, I do. If you go to my Bamboo X1C review, my affiliate link for Bamboo is right here. Okay? I'll drop... I don't think it matters which one you use. I'll drop it in the chat if, if you insist. And uh, those printers are freaking expensive, so the affiliate numbered i mean you buy a you buy a, like a mini quad motor for 25 bucks my affiliate share of that is what like you know i don't know 75 cents <laughs> but you buy a bamboo printer for a thousand bucks my affiliate share of that is significantly more mechanicern thank you for 25 norwegian kroner uh, no apology needed, man. No hard feelings. Don't worry about it. Um, okay. We are coming to the end of the stream. We got 15 minutes left in the stream. Uh, let's get a few more questions in from the non-Super Chat side. Here's a question from <clears throat> Lena. I can't barely read this. Kvyat. Kovskaya. Lena Kvyatkovskaya. Do you find the trainer modes in I'm getting I'm getting there? Uh do you find the trainer mode in Radio Master Radio useful in any way in teaching people flying multi rotors? Uh Lena, uh I never use trainer mode, buddy box if you uh, is another name for it, when I teach people to fly multi rotors. Um there are a couple reasons for that. First is that um a lot of the multi rotors we train on are made to be crashed. Unlike a like a large multi rotor or a fixed wing plane, where if you crash it, it's a disaster. It's just that's the end. It's broken. A multi rotor, if you especially a small one like a three maybe a three inch trainer, if you crash it, worst case scenario, maybe you're going to break a prop. So usually the uh, the um, additional complexity of setting up buddy box isn't worth it. We start the student on the simulator. Once they become somewhat competent in the simulator, so um, like a, a, a typical uh, uh, course for me, if I was gonna do a week long course on, on just piloting, okay? I might spend one to two days in the simulator at most. Many students would be ready to go to the real quadcopters at the end of the first day. Um, and by the end, my goal would be that by the end of the second day, all of the students would be on the real quadcopter because people, people flying simulator for hours on end, they just get burned out, right? But you want to use the simulator to get them to the point where they won't crash the real quad too much. But the reason you don't want them crashing the real quad is more about the training time than the damage to the quad. Now, obviously if you crash a quad, eventually it will break. So you want to minimize the number of crashes. But what I'm more concerned about is that while we're training, if you take off and you immediately crash and you have to walk to get the quad and walk back and set it up and try again, you're just wasting so much time. Whereas on the simulator, boom, you just hit the reset button, you're going again. So once you can fly without crashing for a minute, that's it. 
you're pretty much ready for the real thing. And you're going to crash the real thing too, but yeah, you're going to figure it out. And I'm not going to be in a situation where as an instructor, I'm going to like take over at the last minute. I'm just going to let you crash. You're going to get back up and you're going to try again. Anyway. It could be useful, but I just never use it. And I wouldn't let you fly a quad. If there was an, a quad where if you crash it, it's a disaster, I just wouldn't let you fly it until you had enough experience on smaller ones that I was confident you were ready to go on the big one. Okay. Milo FPV asks, what do you think about walk snail? Is it good enough? Yes. Walk snail, in my opinion, is 100% good enough to be your daily driver. Now, that doesn't mean it's perfect. There are people who are unhappy with like the, the, the little 1S whoop VTX from walk snail. They think it breaks too much. They think it's too fragile. They're like, ah, I've broken like four of these damn things. I'm going back to analog. So like, it's not perfect, but like certainly for like for my five inches, if you told me that I could only use the walk snail VTX and the pro camera for the rest of my life, I'd be like, okay, I'll make, yeah, that'll work. I can do it. That's it's ready. Uh, it's you. There are reasons why you might stick with analog. There are reasons why you might go to HD zero. There are reasons why you might prefer DJI. I'm not saying it's the clear winner, but I am saying it is, it is, it's earned the right to be in the room and be in contention. That's my opinion. Um, do you think we can expect something big coming from them? Milo, Walksnail has said that in the August 2024 timeframe, they will be releasing the second generation of their system with an improved radio that will like 4X the range. That's cool. I will not make any decisions whatsoever based on that expectation because number one, we don't know when it will release. There is every chance that they won't hit their August prediction. And number two, when it releases, there's every chance that it won't live up to their promises. Like we know that when a company says in, in a year from now, I'm going, look at the cyber truck. Need I say more? Company says, we're working on this amazing product. It's going to be so good. And it's going to come out on this date. And then it, when it actually does come out, it's way later and it's way different than what you were promised. And you kind of wonder if you still wish you had it. So cool. I hope they deliver on that, but I'm not going to make a decision based on the expectation that they will deliver. The biggest thing that uh, Walksnail gets wrong is that they release a product and it has a bunch of problems. And then eventually they wrangle it around to a, a working product. Like the Goggles X, when they released, some people, they were fine. Might have been fine. I've had no problems with them. Except the weird fake static that they did on analog that they fixed in a firmware update after a couple people, including me, complained about it. And the overheating that, like some people had problems with the goggles overheating and the screen turning off. Uh, was it a lot of people? I don't know. A lot of people complaining about it on Facebook. What percent of the total goggles sold was it? No one knows. So like, yeah. Uh, if there, if there's a problem with walk snail. It's that they, they sometimes like it's two steps forward, one step back or a new product comes out. And it's like, I wish you'd held it for another three months and really gotten the bugs out. So maybe, maybe just wait a couple months after a new product comes out, just to be sure. <laughs> Burnt Nougat, I've had my 107 for years. Uh, I've had my FAA 107 for years, as you would expect from a person who makes content on YouTube. Uh, acute argon, I, I could argon. Thank you for 50, uh, S E K. 
Uh, I'm a DJI user and I want to buy a cost-effective analog goggles for tiny whooping. Could be secondhand. Um, yeah, I would look for some used SkyZone goggles, maybe. Actually, the SkyZone... The SkyZone 030 is currently priced really nicely. SkyZone 030 is 300 bucks in stock, available. Oh, that's the 020. Well, that's a little, that's not the same. I thought the SkyZone, oh, wait, 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 wait. Huh. What am I thinking of? I just saw these. For like 350 bucks. There's a Sky Zone goggle. For like 350 bucks. Well, the 020 for 299 is not like the worst in the world, but not spectacular. What do we got here? 04X, 04X Pro, 040, 040, yeah, 040 Pro, there you go, well, that's still, that's a fair chunk of money, like, this is a solid buy for 360, though, that's, like, solid for 360, maybe you want cheaper even than that. Anthony DeStefano, thank you for a $5 super chat. How will the Avada 2 head tracking and the new remote impact the FPV community? Not at all. It will not impact the FPV community at all. The DJI users will do their thing. Um, the way that the head tracking works, like you can do head tracking on a gimbal with the uh, Medlin. With the Medlin drone system. I've actually got it on this drone. Right? It's not as elegant as the DJI one, but... Uh, this is designed to hold a GoPro as well. That's why it's got this big beefy gimbal. Like you can do head tracking with this and it can go up and down. But the left to right head tracking on the yaw axis, that's something that requires integration with the flight controller and it's not going to just be like an add-on thing later. Kermit FPV continuing their question. Sent me a mail with pictures. Ooh, pictures of uh, this uh, this uh, receiver thing. Where is it? Oh no! Amazon was unable to cancel my order. Oh well. I guess I'm gonna buy that thing after all. Um, where? Hmm. Kermit FPV, I don't see a mail from you. I don't see a mail from you. I don't know. Maybe it went to Joshua Bardwell at Gmail? No. I don't see a mail from you, Kermit. I'm sorry. Um, Mark Efe, the problem with a 360 camera for head tracking is that the uh, resolution is extremely small because you're taking your 1080 sensor or even a 4K sensor and spreading it out over 180 degrees. And that means your resulting rev re resolution of a reasonable field of view is extremely low. Can you use a non-DJI controller when using the O3 module? Yes, you can. You just need a standard, standard receiver. Kermit, I will keep looking for your email and reply to it when I get it. Um, Henri Benny wants to know, have you ever made a drone with two different arm sizes? How did it fly? I'm wanting to put the three inch arms on the Siren F3 up front and the three and a half inch arms on the back. Uh, your best, you will get the best flight characteristics when the motors are a rectangle or square. Same thing. Uh, did you enjoy the D Avada 2 at all? Yes, 100%. I, I, like, obviously, I'm going to keep flying FPV drones. It's not going to be my daily driver. Uh, I sincerely enjoyed flying it, though. Um, 
it was really cool to kind of be like driving a car in the sky with the trigger and to kind of just like steer it through the sky. The, I, I was like, people heard me be enthusiastic about the motion controller. And I think some people thought I was just hamming it up because I like was shilling for DJI as you do. Uh, and, and it really wasn't like I, I am a jaded and cynical person, but also I am capable of being like impressed by something that I didn't expect to like. And, uh, you know, like the hand controller, like I was sincerely impressed with the hand controller and the, the experience of sort of steering the drone through the air with your hand and pulling a trigger to move it. Um, I like, uh, I really liked being able to kind of look up and down with, I wish that they, and I passed this back to them and I don't know if they'll do it, but I passed this back to them. I wish they would unlock the head tracker when using the regular hand controller instead of the motion controller so that I can be flying and I can look up and down. It would be really cool if they did that. Um, but I really liked it. Um, it's obviously, if I want to fly a drone, I'm just going to fly a manual FPV drone, right? Um, it doesn't have a lot to offer me that I can't get from a regular FPV drone. Like if I wanted to get DJI style shots, I would get something like the Mavic mini, which has a more, does the Mavic mini have a two axis gimbal? I think it does. I would get a small drone with a two axis gimbal so I could get more variety in the shots that I get. Uh, but Anyway, I, I sincerely liked it. Um, so let's see. All the super chats are cleared out. You guys should go check out Steele's review of the Avada 2. Uh, Steele didn't get one from DJI. Well, he kind of did. Uh, Mr. Steele posted a review of the Avada 2 that I think is well worth watching. I will say this. I should, this is a true story. I started showing my wife Steele's review of the Avada 2. I was like, hey, you got to see this. And she sat and watched Mr. Steele's entire review of the Avada 2 and was like chuckling and laughing and smiling. And she was like, that was pretty entertaining. And I was like, did you watch my review of the Avada 2? And she said, I watch your videos all the time. And I was like, yeah, that's not the same thing. Uh, I guess what I'm saying is Mr. Steele stole my woman. At least as far as the YouTube views go. Okay. Okay, guys. Um, we are about to wrap up. In fact, we're two minutes late. Have we... Is Mr. Is Siadi streaming today? I have not seen him in the chat. Hang on. Let's see if he's... Why is Ciadi FPV two different YouTube channels? I don't see him streaming live. All right, let's take... Uh, yeah, Mr. Steal Your Girl. Cute. Uh, let's take uh, just a few more minutes and try and do a speed run of the last few questions. Okay? So uh, just let's try and clear this out because he's... We, Ciadi's, he's not streaming. He's not streaming today. All right, Blunty, we're going to try and speed run these. These will not be thorough or complete answers, but I'm going to try to acknowledge and speed run the questions. Uh, and if you want a more thorough or complete answer, please email me, jb at joshuabardwell.com. Anyone can email me. I try to answer all the questions I get, uh, regardless of whether you're a patron or not. Uh, Striker has a parts list. Thoughts on my parts list? Uh, love it. Love it. Great parts list. No comments. Thumbs up. Casper Sobchak says, Luminaire Axie HD2 patch visor antenna for my V2 goggles will be the best antennas for the O3 and the OG Air unit that would work with my goggle antennas. Um, I would get an SMA adapt. I would get left-hand polarized antennas. That's the thing. If you have left-hand antennas on your V2 goggles, you want left-hand antennas on your O3, go to my website, fpvknowitall.com, and look for the antennas there. Get the antennas with the UFL connector directly. If you can, if you have a working mounting solution for them, if not, 
get an SMA, a UFL to SMA adapter and buy an SMA antenna. That's probably what you're going to end up doing. Daninator. I bought a used OG air unit. It, uh, I can't get to, I can't get OSD working. Do you think it's fixable? Uh, hard to say, Daniel. Hard to say, man, whether it's hardware damage or a software issue. As far as the heat goes, I wouldn't worry about it. It's probably nothing. It's possible to blow the TX and the RX diodes on those so that the OSD doesn't work. So uh, that's possibly what's happened. That is repairable, but since we're in the speed run section, that's all I'm going to say about that. Best replacement for the Crazy B F4 Light AIO. I don't know. I don't know. Carbon Cubs. I would have to check. I check my website, epivknowitall.com. There's a tiny whoop section there. I'd look at what's recommended there. That all comes from Ciotti, and he knows a lot about micros. Hey, JB, first class crash. I fail safe with the FPV controller too. Is it a common issue or what? Yeah, fail safing is a common issue. Watch your signal strength and don't uh, don't fly when you got one bar. Turn around and come home. Uh, Burnt Nougat wants to know, should we upgrade to TXCO, Express LRS, TX, and RX? No, not really. Like if you fly somewhere where there are wide temperature extremes, TXCO fixes it. But for most people, you get plenty of range and you don't need TXCO. How to choose the perfect ESC for my motors? Buy the same brand of ESC as your flight controller so the wiring is easy. That's that's what I would say. <laughs> Noel Albert, I have a Jumper T20. It doesn't work with my Windows PC. It set, connects, stays connected for two seconds, then it disconnects. Noel, most likely, I would guess you have a short circuit in, in your USB connector, and your, your PC is cutting it off because it detects the short circuit. That's my best guess. That's a hardware problem. Try it with other computers. Does it happen with all your computers? Then it's your radio is a hardware problem. Also, yeah, also like... Check in bootloader mode, because that's a different driver that that would use. So Very like, nice. you, you want to see if it's like a radio problem or a software firmware connection problem. So. Very nice. FPV Shed says, I just purchased the Avada 2. It looks like the FCC hacker ham file for the UK is not working. I have no, no information about that. I did test that on mine to see if it would work, just because I needed it to work, and it did work for me. Uh, what I would say is, uh, if you're in the UK, activate through a VPN so that it activates in FCC mode. The thing is, I have never seen a DJI drone where the FCC hack didn't work because if you move from the Europe to the United States, you have the right to unlock it. So I, 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 it's, I can't imagine that DJI locked this out on purpose. It would be yeah, also, uh, inconsistent they it in the first place. Right. This is not here by accident. And they know that everybody in the Europe does the ham unlock, but like they're like, that's not their problem, right? So, but there's a legitimate reason to have this. And I can't imagine they intentionally wanted to disable it permanently, but I don't have any more information as to whether or how it could be done. I could ask my DJI contact and see if they answer. Madsec, why don't you just ask your DJI contact? <laughs> I'm just, I'm just, I'm sorry. I'm just picking on you. Madstech has the honor of being blacklisted by DJI. I am not blacklisted by them. And you should not see that as something like I'm happy to be able to make content about them and get product early. Someday I'm going to piss them off enough that, well, probably not. Madstech, I think Madstech probably pissed them off more than I would ever would. But I respect, I respect that he's been blacklisted by DJI. But I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna give him a hard time about it too. Is the Skyzone Sky 040 Pro a good goggle for his price? Yes. Ruckus DM, can you discuss the battery at the center of drone rotation versus gyro at center of rotation? Ruckus, there is no disadvantage to having the gyro away from the drone's center of rotation. Um for more on that. For more on that. Look at this video. Why it's okay to mount your FC away from the CG. I'm going to give you the link. I'll put it in the chat. And I'm not, since we're in the speed run, I'm not going to go into that any further. I uh, have an M10 GPS. The altitude is nowhere near correct. Yeah. Uh, GPS is very bad at altitude. You need a barometer. 
You really want a barometer for accurate altitude. GPS is just inherently bad at altitude. It's good at position. It's bad at altitude. Should I start the FPV hobby with the Avada too? What's your real opinion? Um, if you buy the Avada 2, like, here's the thing. I wouldn't do that. That's not how I would say tell you to start. But, like, I went to Minefield a couple of years ago, and there were way more people than I expected who were flying the, the potato, the DJI FPV drone. There were, there, were so, there were, like, 10 people flying the potato and having a great freaking time. And it, I was like, okay. I knew you were out there. Like, there's probably going to be a ton of people who would be super frustrated by, a, a, like, a real FPV drone who will fly the Avada 2 and freaking love it. And I, you would just have to decide if you're one of those people. Is there a reason why most people use Betaflight if INEV has better GPS support? Cer Cerxy. Uh, Betaflight is supported on a wider variety of flight controllers. INEV is only supported on a few, on some flight controllers. Betaflight is supported on a bunch of them. And Betaflight flies better for, uh, for uh, Acro. Do you know of any way to mount or install? And, oh, and it's very difficult on small drones to get a good, clean GPS and compass reading. Until recently, I never required a compass in order to do the things that it wants to do. And so, like, since you couldn't get a clean compass reading on a five inch anyway, you just run beta flight because I not going to really give you anything. But now in I 7.1, they have the ability to work without a compass. Uh, and so that may mean more people choose I nev. Do you not have any way to mount an analog module in the HD0 goggles? Like inside? No. Like it's the the case is 3D the the CAD file for the case is public. You could mod the CAD file in some way, but no, nothing nothing I know of. Has anyone bought and tested? Okay, we already answered that. Alexander FPV in a world where marketing always demands the biggest number. Um, so yeah, we talked about that. Maxim Hranatov. Maxim Hranatov. Goggles 2 Integra or Goggles 3 with O3 support in the future? How does it compare? What I would tell you to do is uh, wait. Wait until the O3. You can wait a month or however long to until the O3 actually has O3 support and you know what you're getting and then you can make an informed decision. Just a quick Today, piece of information. Integra. Yeah. Avada released with Goggles 2, and then three months later, the O3 unit released, and then two weeks later, the Goggles 2 got the update for the Bingo. Vista in-ear unit. The Bingo. other thing I'll mention is that Madstech in the chat said he was told today that there was a pre-release version of the firmware that did support the O3 on the Goggles 3 that was yep. out and then got patched out before the yep. release of the system. So that means what? it has been developed. It yeah. is very unlikely that it's been developed and not be released at some point. That's Absolutely. 100% the hardware can do it. It's just a question of when DJI decides to make it happen. But we don't know. Like, for example, what if, do you think that the Goggles 2 are going to get an upgrade to let them support the O4 Air unit? That's plausible to me. They're only one generation old. When that happens, will the Goggles 2 so still support the old Vista generation? We don't, maybe. Maybe DJI will lock that out. We don't know. But it's possible that a future will exist where the Goggles 2 and Integra can support three generations, Vista, O3, and O4, whereas the, the G3 only supports the O3 and the O4 and not the Vista, in which case the G2 and Integra are like going to be the golden ticket. So I, you, you have to wait because you just do not know. At, so many times I've seen DJI give you something you really want and then take something away that you didn't. Oh, wait, 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 wait. I thought I was just supposed to get something. I didn't know I was supposed to lose something at the same time. Look at the compatibility of the V2 goggles with the O3 and the old hand controller. When you upgrade the V2 goggles to support the O3, you lose the hand controller, the black, the old V1 black hand controller. Oops, F you. So I would wait. Today, get the Integra or the G2. Uh, one but, quick note is just that the it's possible that the Integra and the G2 will be separate because the Integra has an extra chip in it, the E3 chip. So that mm. chip might enable the future support, but the Goggles 2 might not. That's something to know that there is a different chip in there. Yes. Uh, and the other thing is, he says, how does it compare to Optics FOV Fit? 
So like, let's pretend it supported it. Would it ma not matter? Are they both equivalent? Is Goggles Three way better? Uh, like, I, like the, I think the Goggles Three are the. I don't know. To be honest with you, like when I reviewed them, I basically reviewed the Goggles and the Avada as a unit because today there is you can't even buy the Goggles Three standalone today. You can only buy them with the Avada Two in a kit. Is my understanding. All the individual pages are pre order so like there is, and today the goggles three only work with the Avada and the Mini Four Pro and something, but they don't work with the standalone O3 Vista or standalone O4, which doesn't even exist. So there's literally no reason for an FPV for a quote unquote FPV hobbyist to buy the G3 today. You can't buy it, and even if you wanted to, it wouldn't work with any of your drones. The only person buying the G3 today is going to be a person buying the Avada kit, and at that point. The G3 is the only goggles that work with the Avada kit. And subconsciously, my mind, when I was thinking, this is going to be an hour-long video, what can I cut out to make it only a 40-minute video? I didn't discuss the goggle specs at all because today, it's the only goggle you can get. To, you see? There's no alternative to this goggle today. Now, when the O3 becomes compatible with the G3 and the O4 releases and the FPV hobbyists actually have to make a decision... That's when I'll go back and I'll look at those things. But to be honest with you, I don't even, I've heard 44 degree FOV, same as the Integra. I didn't even check that because like, I was just like, it doesn't fucking matter. I'm not sure if Chad understood here. Maybe you said something I didn't hear, but the goggles three being standalone doesn't matter because you can't use it with anything except the Avada right. 2. That's the whole point. You, you, like, you I, we know even... there's a standalone skew. There is a standalone skew yes. out there, but it doesn't matter. It's irrelevant because you can't do anything with it. You couldn't, if you could buy the, you can't buy the goggles three alone today. And if you could, you, you can, wouldn't have you a single. That's what people can, are saying. You can. They're pre-order. Yes, they're, 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 they're all pre-order. They're all standalone skews. But they're all pre-order. They're all pre-order. They're all pre-order. No one has it in stock. DJI is not selling it. Okay. Are they? Am I wrong? People are, people claim the, that there were some and they went out of stock, but I don't know if there's any proof of that. Okay. I've heard that from a bunch of people. Okay. Okay, if I'm wrong about that, then that's okay because the second point is still true. It, number one, I, I don't think you can buy, but maybe you can buy the G G3 on standalone. But number two, number two, even if you can, there is nothing you can fly them with. Well, you could own a Nevada, you could own a Mini Four. Okay, or uh, the other one. What was the other one? I forget the other one. But like, as far as FPV drones go, you, there's nothing you can fly it with. Okay, so I'll go into I'll go into the specs of the goggles later. It's forty four degree field of view, ten eighty p one hundred. It's basically the same as the Integra. It's my is my quick rundown answer. Okay, what about resolution on HD zero with walk snail? Full resolution, ten eighty p, seven twenty p, full resolution. Uh, if you check continuing the we're we're like we're gonna go a half hour long, Blunty. I apologize for keeping you, but I figured if Seattle's not streaming, we should try. Um, have you checked out the new FPV Cycle Glide 8mm frame? I have not. We're in the speed run. My Vista is showing HD fonts in 4.5, but no LQ. What do I need to change? Ooh. Like, no LQ at all? Uh, RSSI, ADC, RSSI channel and ADC are off. That's a tough sounds one. Like, you gotta, yeah. It sounds like you might not have actually applied. Like, make sure you're applying the HD preset for 4.5. Not mm. the old preset. It should still show LQ, though, whether you do it no, HD or not. No, the old preset did not show LQ, right? Oh, you mean the old DJI preset? I mean, that's the only way you can not get LQ in the OSD, unless you've got a drug Valid. under something. Right? Yeah, right. did you did you load the WTFOS preset? Wait, what goggles does he have? He says Vista, but he doesn't say the goggles. We, we can't answer this question without knowing what goggles you have. Need to email me. Freak Light. We already answered a bunch of your questions. We got that one already. Uh, the issue by the Radio Master RP3, can the wrong baud rate in Betaflight... No. The wrong baud rate in Betaflight would not cause the receiver to not bind. It would cause the receiver to not talk to the flight controller. And if you don't know the difference, go ahead and email me, jb at joshuabardwell.com. Oh my God, we're still 18 questions away from being done. Jesus, I can't keep up. All right, we got to call this... We got to call this... Well, we got a few more super chats. Let me clear them out. Then we're going to be done. I got a Vision 40 1S and the OSD disappeared. I can't get it back. Is that the flight controller or the VTX? That is a, the... Could be either. Check the wiring between the FC and the VTX. Maybe one of the TXRX wires broke off. 
Donnie Lama, thank you for a $5 super chat. How hot are your motors supposed to get? Short version, if you can pinch the motors and they feel warm but not painful, you're fine. If you pinch the motor immediately after a flight and you go, ooh, 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 ah, mm, 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 oh, that's too hot. Corrupt syntax. Are hot dogs just tacos? Pineapple on pizza? Thank you for $2. Corrupt syntax. I'm not even going to answer that question. Appreciate your throwaway question and, and your money. Colin Stapleton. I have 20 hours in the sim and have cut my teeth with a Meteor 65 Pro. What should be my next drone? Thinking of 3.5. Uh, Thank you for a five pounds. Colin Stapleton. I agree. A 3.5 inch uh, is a great choice. I, I've always go back to the Gep RC Smart 3.5, which was a 3.5 inch I really enjoyed. That's a little dated. There are a couple new 3.6 inch that I think are really uh, exciting. The Gep RC Domain 3.6 uh, might be a better modern choice. I really do enjoy 3.5, 3.6 inch freestyle though. Uh, you should check out something like that. Uh, and things you need. Thank you for 20 rupees. Uh, please tell the best F7 flight controller in India. I have no idea what the best F7 flight controller in India is. I have no idea what is available in India. I Like, I, I don't even know. How could I even answer that question? Um, I appreciate your donation. I don't want to disrespect your donation, but there's literally no way for me to answer that question. India is an, en an enormous country. Like, I'm, like, did, can you order from China? I don't know. I can't. That's impossible to answer that question. Uh, if you give me a list of FCs that you can buy, I'll tell you which one I like the best. That's it. Okay, guys, that is going to wrap us up. Thank you so much for uh, your time, for your donations. I will see you again tomorrow. Uh, as a reminder, uh, I will be traveling next week. And sorry about that. Uh, so we will be off for a couple weeks. I will schedule new live streams. Uh, go to the live streams tab on my channel uh, or you'll start to see announcements or something when I come back. Uh, I will be here Monday and Tuesday for the news but then next weekend if you only watch the Sunday streams I will not be here this coming Sunday. Bye everybody. Bye everybody.